This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities. We were very lucky. In fact, Nick Hauser, who's going to be lecturing today, sat on a committee, and he did not choose himself, actually. <laughs> but he sat on a committee, uh, along with Elias Bonilla and Bernie Sargent, uh, to help get a grant from Humanities Texas called a Major Project Grant. And we won that grant. Uh, it was called the, uh, the uh, Missions of uh, Spain in the Borderlands. And that's what this series of lectures has been about, it is about the different missions and about Spain's role in creating those missions in her new colonies. What happened today, Skip Clark was supposed to be our speaker, and he was going to talk on San Elizario. Skip called me, I guess about three weeks ago, profusely apologizing so that something happened and he would be unable to do the lecture. I said, well, maybe we can reschedule you. He said, if you can. He said, but I really apologize. He says, but I'll try to find someone. Well, he hadn't. Well, Nick was visiting the museum, and I said, hey, Nick, can you do a talk on Santa Lazario for me? And he said, sure, what, what about? Uh, yeah, what about, <laughs> he yeah. Said, then Nick said, oh, oh, what about the unknown mission? I said, I don't know about it. Yeah, well, it's unknown. <laughs> yeah. So that's uh, what Nick Hauser is okay. going to talk about. If you don't know him, he's a very well-renowned historian here in El Paso. He is the official archivist for the Tigua tribe. And if you get a chance, do visit our exhibit on that. It's only $5. If you are a member, it's free. So you can see that. Today's lecture, we have Humanities Texas to thank. And they are the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities uh, affiliate here in the state. So I'm very happy that Nick was able to step in and talk about the unknown mission of San Elizario. This is before the Presidio. So I think you'll enjoy the talk. I'm looking forward to it, because I don't know mm anything -hmm. about it. So let's welcome okay. Nick. Well, thank you. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, I'm not an expert. I'm a student of history. Uh, my background is history, anthropology, and public health. And I've always learned, first astounded, but no longer. Now I really, I mean, I really, I always appreciate it. That is that when I give a talk on a certain subject here in the El Paso area, there's people in the audience that blow my mind. Either they correct me because I said something that was incorrect or it was you know, part of history that's been written by some historian and it ain't true, and they would explain it to me, okay? And then the other thing is, they would tell me stuff I didn't know anything about. And there's people here in the, in the audience, and there's a number of you, and Marta, you, and, uh, and, and George over here, uh, are, have ties to San Elizario, San El Ciario, okay? And, uh, and you probably know a great deal more than I do, or you can add to it. But I came from the Pacific Northwest, not the Southwest, and uh, came down here pretty young, and I went to school at the University of Arizona, try to be brief, and I spent uh, uh, the spring semester one year uh, as a graduate student, and the professor said, if anyone would like to come to El Paso work with it, with an Indian community we know nothing about, stay after class, but you better know some Spanish. So I said, well, I know some Spanish. So I stayed after class. I thought there would be six or seven students. I was the only one. So I stayed after class. That was 1966, and I was sent to El Paso. There I met Tom Diamond. You know Tom Diamond, who's the... Uh, well-known attorney. He's in his 90s, and his mind is as bright and shiny as any as ever, you know. And uh, he and his wife met me, and they took me down to Isleta, and I uh, lived with a family down there in the in the uh, Barrio de los Indios. And as I began to do research there that summer, and that was 66, that's when there was something going on with a basketball team I knew nothing about at UTEP, which I knew nothing about. And at the same time, there was something going on in a place called the Shamazal. I didn't know anything about that. But I wanted to really focus on the Tiwa, and the tribe really wanted me to look at, guess what? What happened to our land grant? We had a land grant. So I began to go through deeds. And Tom Diamond, who was my sort of advisor, was a, he was the volunteer tribal attorney at the time, he told me, don't go through the deed indexes. That's too logical. Go through er every deed book. What? Yeah, he said, try to go through every one up to... Uh, 19, 1871 and even beyond if you can. So I went through maybe 20, 30,000 deeds. But the good thing about that, going through those deeds was, 
I found stuff that had really sometimes no, no direct relationship with the Tiwa tribe or with this letter, but was really interesting. So I would take note of it or get a photocopy. And I did uh, most of that at the uh, El Paso County Historical, uh, excuse me, El Paso County uh, offices, right? Okay, is that right? Marta, get that right? Uh, where they have their uh, archives, okay? But a lot was done at UTEP. And, uh, and Leon Metz was there at that time. He was the uh, custodian or the, or the superintendent or whatever it is of, the, of uh, the archives at UTEP, okay? So he helped me out. So Every now and then I'd find, like I said, something that didn't have anything directly to do with this letter but interested me. I found all kinds of papers and what have you by Sam, Mag uh, by, uh, uh, by James Wiley McGoffin, even his brother Sam, who'd, who married uh, Susan McGoffin, Susan Shelby McGoffin. I mean, just an example. But then one day, one day, I found, actually I found it in two deed books. Deed book, what? Try to remember, C, which is an early deed book, and also deed book eight. Sometimes the same deeds are recorded in maybe more than one deed book. Sometimes they have, the same deed may have different recording dates, just to make sure that, you know, to, to protect their property and what have you, they would go back to the county and, you know, and, and, and get their uh, uh, deed, uh, how do I say it, uh, authenticated, what have you, and show the papers. And I found one that really astounded me, if I can find it right now. Uh, whew, I'm so well organized, I don't know what I'm doing here. Just a minute. I gave two talks, and I'm in the wrong today, and I'm in the, this is my second talk, I'm in the wrong talk. Oh, excuse me, here it is, here it is, we're getting to it, closer. There it is. Is this it? No, that ain't it. Okay, Hauser, you're so well organized. It's amazing. Ooh, just a minute. I'm going. Okay. In deed book eight, page 30, that was it. So maybe it's on this side too. Yeah, here's deed, the same one in deed book C, page 439. They're old deeds of, of the county. They're on microfilm, too, as well as you can see the original. I like to see the original rather than just on microfilm. And the instrument date of this deed in San Elizario is December 10th, 1853. That's quite a long time ago. And this uh, is the church conveyance from the people of San Elizario to the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Uh, and Telesforo Montes, you've heard of him if you're from San Elizario, was Justice of the Peace, a major uh, um, contributor to the history of the area. What was he in trade and a whole lot of things, farming and, and political uh, positions and what have you with the county and down there. He was Justice of the Peace, uh, and he signed off on this in uh, March 1st, 1855. So the first... Uh, it was probably a recording date. The, the actual uh, deed took place on December 10th, 1853. And, and it contains a list of witnesses as members of the community, all men. And it's fairly comprehensive in terms of the listing. It includes people like, you've heard of Gregorio Garcia, right? Who was what? With the Texas Rangers and what have you, right? Fought Apache, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Jesus Lujan. Uh, of course, I said... Uh, Telesforo Montes, Antonio Severo Borajo, he's the priest that was there, uh, Jesus Maria Lujan, and Leon Garanillo, okay? These are people that signed off on this. Uh, it, was, uh, it was filed, like I said, on March 1st, 1855, although it had been implemented the instrument date of December 10th, 1853. Now, what's interesting is about this uh, this deed is that, I'm trying to find it here, uh, it refers uh, to the uh, property as being the Iglesia de los Indios. So they're giving the Indian church to the Catholic church? Indian church doesn't make any sense, at least to me when I looked at that at first. And I started thinking, you know, you know the answer to that? 
It's not the Presidio Chapel. We know that there was a Presidio Chapel in San Elizario. Everybody went there, to, you know, for mass and funerals, weddings, and what baptisms and what have you. But what is this Indian church, okay? Well, if you go back in, in the history of San Elizario, uh, it was uh, founded, let me see if I can find the, the material here. It was founded in 1789, I believe. Yeah, there it is, founding of the San Elizario Presidio, 1789. Incidentally, these images, I've got a lot of them. I gave, gave some to people in San Elizario, especially Ben uh, Sanchez. Uh, I did exhibits there in San Elizario. They're there, there today. Unfortunately, even though they had this serious flooding, uh, there, was, there was damage, but not extensive, terrible damage. But the walls and some papers that were on the floor near, nearby got wet, didn't they, Marty? You know that, right? And uh, so anyway, I'm selfish. Well, my, my exhibit, fortunately, was high enough that it wasn't damaged. But actually, there were, the, a lot of, mo most of the items weren't, did not suffer damage, although I'm sure there was serious damage in terms of the walls and what have you, and some documents that were on the floor. But I, I, I had these images made uh, with a text, and my son helped me with, because uh, he's a computer expert. And uh, so we mounted those on uh, panels with wheels there at Santa Lazar. I think I did five or six or something. And uh, I took them to the printer to have them printed. And the people that were supposed to put the frames, put these in frames, which were you know, mounted, which are today in the, in the exhibit down there, they hired someone fresh out of high school who apparently never used a ruler before because all the measurements were all wrong. And, they said, and when they found that, they couldn't believe it. I had 30 or 50 or one of these panels. We couldn't put them in the frames, the wrong size, either mainly too small, you know. So they said, well, we'll have to print some more. It's going to cost us a lot of money. It's terrible. And El Paso Community Foundation came in and helped them. And they re reprinted them, okay. So I ended up with these extras. So I, I take advantage of them, bring them here, and I've given quite a few to the people down there in, in, in the community of San Elizario. But anyway, the, the, the uh, founding of the Presidio was in 1789. And if you look now, if I can find it, I'm so well organized. Here I am, not so bad. Here's the El Paso Mission Trail brochure here, and it has all the missions on it, right? And if you go up and down the road there, Socorro Mission Trail, San Elizario's down there. It's the end of, you know, you first you go through Isleta, Socorro, and then the San Elizario. Okay? When I first worked with a community down there, really great people on the Genealogical Society, uh, are some of you members of that yes. today? Good, okay. Uh, I, I suggested uh, we uh, identify. Santa Lazaro as a site for a mission. And people kind of got upset when they heard that and said, no, no, it's a Presidio Chapel, which it was, okay? However, at the time, I didn't know that much about it until I started to do research on it. But at least for over 35 years or so, it was, and I don't know how active it was, it was a, a mission. Now, what kind of a mission would you have? Because you have Isleta, that's Tiwa Indians, right? Socorro, mainly Piro at the time. Across the river, you have Senecu, which is Piro, okay? But you had no Pueblo Indians in the area of San Lazario. What, how could there be an Indian mission? Have any ideas? Okay, well, here's what happened. Uh, back, one of the reasons why uh, the San Elizario was founded, the major reason, looking for my little notebook here, the major reason it was founded was to protect the area, especially down there, because it's quite a distance from El Paso del Norte, where, where the main mission was. Gosh knows where that was, because they had many different locations. One was at San Lorenzo, one was right there where the, where the Guadalupe mission was. And I suspect another, excuse me, did I say Mission, I mean Presidio. One Presidio was uh, right next to the Mission Guadalupe. It moved around a bit, and then uh, it was over at San Lorenzo. It was called El Real, which was another term for Mission. Uh, excuse me, for Presidio. Got it again. And then, uh, and then there was one 
maybe in the area at La Corona de San Jose, apparently, or San Jose uh, Presidio. Okay, well anyway, the, the problem for years uh, were Apaches and Comanches, especially Apaches, because in the 13, 1400s, before Oñate got here, before there were any Spanish people here, the Athabascans from the north, that would be all the way to Alaska and Canada, right, started to come south. Uh, might have something to do with the climate change, I don't know, that might be interesting to take a look at. Uh, but they were hunters and gatherers, and to hunt and gather sometimes you need new territory. And so let's go south, so they kept going south. And when they got down here, at least by the uh, by the 1400s or so, even the 1300s, when they got down here, well, they encountered, uh, at least in New Mexico, they encountered Pueblo Indians. And uh, they were sedentary agricultural people. They hunted and gathered, but they were uh, really agricultural people and therefore settled. So they had Pueblos. And who were these people that showed up from the north? They were mainly uh, Apache, Apath, Apath, excuse me, Ap 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 excuse me, help me, Athapascans, excuse me, I'm getting all mixed up. Who were Athapascans, yeah. Who were Apache and Navajo, okay? So uh, they came down here. And uh, they had a, more or less a symbiotic, friendly relationship with the Pueblo Indians because they could come in and trade and what have you. They weren't always enemies and what have you, like you see in a lot of books. They traded and what have you. Everything was more or less working out fairly well until the Spanish came in. 1598 Oñate came here. And uh, that's where the whole thing began to break down, the relationship between the, the Athapascans and the uh, Pueblo Indians. Uh, the Spanish uh, could easily work and with the uh, Pueblo Indians in terms of uh, 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 establishing missions, right? And uh, they're settled people, are not moving around all the time. And uh, they could put a priest in there, a, a Franciscan, and he could work with the people, even learn their language, okay? And gain their trust and what have you. So uh, the Pueblo sort of made a, a, how do I say it, a compromise. They accepted the new religion, but they also kept their own. So they go to church, and then the next day they might go to their Tusla or Kiva, their ceremonial chamber, and they, you know, work that out this, this way or that way, no problem. So that worked out okay. Uh, however, the relationship of the Pueblo Indians, uh, like I said, began to, with the Apaches, and the Navajo began to deteriorate when the Spanish came in. And next thing you know, the problems that... Uh, people had on the Camino Real, or Camino Real de Adentro, the Royal Road of the Interior, was that uh, often uh, um, columns of, uh, of horses, mules, and supplies, and carts, and what have you, would be attacked by Apaches, or Comanches. Apa Comanches came in later, so anyway, that created a, a real problem, and that's sort of the crux of this talk. Uh, Interesting because uh, here at, UT at UTEP, nearby in the, in the hills up there where UTEP is, okay, it, you can look out from the, the hills there on, on campus at UTEP and you can look out and see the valley, particularly Ciudad Juarez across the river and all that. Well, the original Indians that were here were the Manzos and Sumas. The Sumas were more, uh, uh, how do I say it, a migratory uh, uh, people that were into hunting and gathering and they lived next to the Monzos, and the Monzos preferred living near the river because uh, they could not only hunt and you know a lot of game and what have you. The Sumas took advantage of that, but they could also use the water for plants because they were agricultural people, and they were related to the Pueblos. They had some of the same clan names as the Pueblos up in New Mexico, which is interesting. And Bandelier, who was an early ethnologist that came through the area in the 1880s. Uh, met the Monzo Indians in Ciudad Juarez and he, he got the, uh, he made a list of the clan names and he was really surprised because he had worked in New Mexico among the other Pueblo Indians and they had many of the same uh, clans like the Green Corn and what have you, Blue Corn Clan and what have you. So anyway, uh, one thing about UTEP, unless I got off, the, my mind got off, uh, the hills there 
And I found this out when I was talking in the 1960s to Monzo Indians who I found in the uh, in Ciudad Juarez area, particularly at San Lorenzo. They told me that their grandparents would run over across the river and create a big fire up on the mountain where UTEP is. And I said, well, why did they do that? Well, because there were Apache ra raiders coming in, or Comanches, or bandits, or something, and we wanted to warn the people. You know, we didn't have telephones or anything, so we would uh, cause, uh, you know, create a fire up there to let people know, you know, watch out, danger. And then, if, you know, then I started, when I was working in Isleta, I found out that there's a, uh, a hill down there uh, in, on Socorro Road, close to where the uh, mission is. Uh, it's where the tribe now has their economic development uh, center. I don't know if you know Pat Riggs, she's the director of it. And they had a hill there, the largest sand hill in the area. And its name, La Loma de Espia, the hill of the spy, spy hill. And they said that hill was very important because if Apaches were attacking in the area, the tribal people would ascend that sand hill, especially the governor and what have you, and they would light a big bonfire during the day or at night, either way. And they would also have their drum and they would be announcing to people, watch out, danger. And the, the primary danger, of course, were Apaches in the area. So I thought that's interesting. And I looked at some of the, the, the deeds in the area here, going back in the 1800s, right? Early deeds. And there's one, one place in, in, in Isleta, right near the high school, you know what the, the name of it was? And later, the street name, it became a street name. It isn't anymore. But it was called Vado de Apache. What is Vado? It's a crossing, right? Like a river crossing. And the river, you know, is capricious. At least it was until Elephant Butte Dam. It moved all over the place. You know, it would change, uh, you know, it would create new channels. Sometimes uh, in Isleta, Socorro and San Lazario had at one time, it result of floods in 1829, early 1830s, those communities became an, La Isla, an island. They, you know, surrounded by the river. One bank here, one over there. So anyway, that's the way the river was. So anyway, uh, what happened was, uh, getting back here, uh, we, we know that in 1598, April 30th, that's a, a Ascension Day, right? San Lazario, somewhere in the area of San Lazario, maybe could have been further down the river, Oñati came through, right, with his Spanish uh, colonists. And that included, I don't know how many, what was it, 15, 20 uh, Franciscan priests, I believe, that were going to you know, serve as missionaries. Well, at least they spent some time there. And he wrote down in his, in his, uh, in his uh, uh, ledger, he said, I set forth from the province of Santa Barbara and finding myself on the banks of the Rio del Norte within a short distance from the first settlements of New Mexico, which are found along this river, having opened a broad and level road for my wagons and other, which others may follow without difficulty, and having traveled on foot over 100 leagues through unsettled country and where I desire to take possession of this land on this day, April 30th, the Feast of Ascension of our Lord in the, in the year 1598, okay? And that's your Thanksgiving day, isn't it? Okay. However, uh, one of the things he wanted to do was establish missions, but you know, San, San Elazar at that time wasn't San Elazar. It was a you know, place on, along the river, but he was at least in the vicinity. And then on May 4th, he and his people, with the help of Monzo Indians, they crossed the river where Hart's Mill is. You know where Hart's Mill is? Okay. Hart's Mill, I'm, I'm getting sort of off on this, but that's probably the, one of the most important historic sites in all of El Paso area, okay? And it's also the most neglected and unknown. And, uh, you know, that's, a, and part of the problem is because we're on the border. We don't always have good relationships on this side or that side, and we got border patrol going up and down and all this, and here's, you know, an area that, you know, that's very, very important historically. Uh, on the other side of the river from Hart's Mill was an earlier mill that uh, belonged to uh, Ponce de Leon. And, uh, and even the, the, uh, the soldiers, when they came down here in Donovan, the war with Mexico, right, or the invasion of Mexico, however you look at it, uh, they saw that, that flour mill there on the other side of the river. Hart's Mill didn't exist. 
And they went over there and r repaired the mill and took possession of it. The Mexican army had wanted to destroy it, but they didn't have enough time. They had to get the heck out because Donovan's troops were coming in. So that mill was repaired. What did they do? They re repaired it so they could grind corn, wheat, and what have you for soldiers. You know what else they ground? Salt. And they gathered the salt, a lot of it, from the Guadalupe salt flax. Well, getting off here on this thing. But anyway, uh, by uh, 1724, something rather important happened in the area. Close to, actually more than close to San Elizario. And that was, there was a guy by the name of Antonio Tiburcio de Ortega. And he purchased a hacienda, which is now San Elizario which became known as Nuestra Señora de la Soledad de los Tiburcios, okay? By 1730, six years later, the hacienda had over 6,000 acres in crops, corn and wheat, and it had a great deal of land in terms of grazing lands. So it was a pretty good deal. It had a population of over 200 residents, 21 families. But guess what happened? The Apaches started to show up, you know, oh, you know, and started raiding Tiburcio, the Tiburcio's Hacienda, Hacienda de los Tiburcios, plural Tiburcios. And what did they take? Mules, blankets, whatever they could get. Sometimes children, you know, boom, that was it. So, uh, so several years later, that Hacienda had to close, okay? And that was in 1787. They finally had to just close it up because they couldn't withstand the attacks from the Apaches. And then uh, in 1789, oh, let me first get, get a little bit back in time here. There, there, was a, there was a presidio established in 1774 called Guajoquilla, Guajoquilla. And it's where the it's, today, it's in the area where Hamas Chihuahua is. You know where that is, Hamas Chihuahua? Uh, it was moved from, from, from there, from the, that area, Hamas Chihuahua, north towards the river, close to Santa Lazaria, but about 40 miles away. And it was establ they established a new, Hase, Hase, uh, excuse me, new presidio. And what site? Uh, uh, well, it was just 40 miles away and that is 40 miles away from Los Tiburcios Hacienda, which later became San Elizario. Now, what happened was that, uh, trying to go back in here, uh, the, the uh, 1789, well, before 1789, there were so many Apache attacks. We know that Tiburcios Hacienda was abandoned, uh, and that happened in 1787. So, Gua, Guajoquilla Presidio, the one that, uh, that was established 40 miles downriver from San Lazario, it was abandoned. The troops were located on the Hacienda Traversios. Now, the reason that was done was because the, all kinds of problems along the Camino Real, and the Spanish wanted more protection for the El Paso Valley, and they figured that, that Presidio, 40 miles from you know what you know, is now Hacienda, San Lazario was too far away, so they brought it up to the, the old Hacienda de Tiburcios, which had been only abandoned several years earlier, two years earlier. It was a good site because it was closer to the El Paso community, the valley, uh, like uh, Isleta, Socorro, and what have you. And uh, it was also uh, advantageous because these presidios uh, had to be more or less self-reliant. To be self-reliant, they needed farmland. And uh, so the soldiers would not only be serving as soldiers, but they'd be working as farmers and what have you, and their wives and what have you. They'd be grinding wheat and corn and what have you, and planting crops, uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, taking care of the animals, that, that, you know, sheep and cattle and what have you, herding them. So Santa Elizario was founded in 1789 because it would be a more favorable site for a, a self-reliant or self-sustaining Presidio community. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. But what's really fascinating to me is that in that period, the 1780s, the uh, Spanish realized that 
the Apache attacks were becoming so bad they needed to do something about it, you know, like move the Presidio 40 miles upriver to uh, Tabricio's Hacienda and what have you. But they, some, some, some local uh, uh, military uh, commanders in the Southwest, as well as uh, uh, the person who was responsible uh, for all those presidios, as well as even the uh, viceroy in Mexico City, began to realize, you know, every now and then these Apaches that cause all this problem, they come into the communities in the El Paso area and other areas. They come into, because uh, they're hungry. They're, they want to trade. And so, uh, and they, they want to establish peace. You know, that's just for a little while. Then they want to get the, free, the, the goodies and then take off again and they're free again. So, so gradually a new program was developed, uh, a new Presidio program. It was called Apaches de, de Paz. Apaches of Peace. The idea was to make the Apaches, uh, these m migratory people, raiders and what have you, bring them into the communities and make, make them dependent upon Spanish goods, food. We got sugar, you guys never heard of sugar. You know, all this stuff, you know, make them dependent. And also give them uh, uh, weapons, uh, muskets and what have you. But don't give them good quality, give them sort of third quality type, because then the, 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 the muskets will be needing repairs and what have you, so they'll come to, to us and our blacksmiths will be able to you know, repair them and what have you, so make them dependent. Then also get a missionary there to convert them to Christianity so they can become uh, self-reliant, uh, sedentary Christians and part of the community and produce corn, wheat, and what have you. Of course, that's kind of difficult because they were never farmers in the, very few had any farming experience. Uh, and that, that's kind of interesting because I worked with uh, many Apache communities in Arizona, including San Carlos, way back in the 60s and 70s. And there, uh, the government finally gave up trying to make farmers out, out of them. It just didn't work. But they were great when it came to cattle raising, you know, and sheep and what have you. Really fantastic. So, Anyway, uh, my, my theory is now, and I'm just guessing. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I could talk while the same thing is on. Let's move it, Norma. My wife, Norma, she's going to, yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, here we are. There you can see Guadalupe Mission over here. Senecu. There was a mission here, Senecu. It's still there today. Isleta. Socorro and San Lazare, uh oh, is that a mission? It's a Presidio Chapel, but I think also for a short while it was, I'm pretty darn sure, an Apache mission. Okay, let me see what else here. I'm just looking at this. Okie dokie, let's go to the next one. Oh, this is interesting. Uh, uh, John Peterson, who was an anthropologist, very good at UTEP, did research down there at San Lazare, and I haven't looked. He left, unfortunately after being here a number of years, but he did, he did archaeological work there at San Lazario, looking at the old sites where the uh, Presidio was, okay? And, uh, and I've, I've got to sit down one of these days and look through his, 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 his reports because he has maps of what he found and what have you. And that's just uh, uh, the Presidio of San Lazario based on what, on what he found. Okay, Norma? And this, of course, who's that? That's San Lazario. And San Elciar, you probably know a great deal more. I found out a long time ago giving talks that you learn so much from the people in the audience and they correct you. And oh, this is, uh, and especially people here that are from, uh, have the ties to uh, San Elizario. Uh, this is the image of the Spanish, uh, uh, actually he was from France, Elciar of France. He was a patron saint of soldiers. So that makes, sense, doesn't it, to have a saint in a uh, Presidio chapel that, uh, you know, is a saint of soldiers. And interesting, uh, so, so that became their saint. And uh, the Presidio itself had double walls, had two towers. Uh, this is interesting. Outside the Presidio was farmland, 
The people that were farmers there also had to work the farm, the, their own lands. In 1791, the King of Spain gave them apparently a, a land grant, okay, of uh, four leagues, okay, a league in each direction. And, uh, but outside the walls of that presidio were not only, like I said, uh, the fields and grazing lands, but also wickiups, brush shelters of the Apaches. And I think in that area outside the Presidio Wall, this is just my guessing, was the original mission of the, of the Apaches. And I have no idea the name of that mission. I don't think it was maybe, who knows? I don't know if it was the same saint or what it was named. It would be interesting. If I were a young graduate student in history, one of the things I would like to do, and you know, I may spend months and go, go nowhere, would be to really find out more about this mysterious mission of the Apaches that was at San Elizario. It only lasted for less than 35 years. The problem was, whenever the Apaches were unhappy, there was a reason to leave, they'd get the hell out of San Elizario. Boom, go back to the mountains and valleys and plains and what have you and uh, you know, become hunters and gatherers and raiders. Of course, Spanish didn't like the idea of raiders coming in. And years ago, I talked to an old man, his name was Eric Tortilla. And he was, in, he was from Mescalero, he and his wife. I met them in Mescalero, and he was in his 80s, and this was probably 1967. He told me, I asked him about El Paso area and his, his grandfathers and you know, great-grandfathers, what they thought of the El Paso area, and he said, well, it was like a big shopping mall. We, they would come down and, you know, go into a village and take some you know, cattle, some sheep, maybe take a kid, you know, blah, 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 blankets, you know, and then, you know, it was like a shopping mall. That's how we, you know, took advantage of it. So, uh, what also happened, and it happened with the Sumas. I don't know if you ever heard of the Sumas. They were probably uh, uh, Athapascan, related to the Apaches, and they were among the first people that we knew of here when, when Onyati came here, Monzos and the Sumas, Monzos being agricultural, Pueblo, as I said, Pueblo-like. The Sumas, they tried to convert. Now, it's hard to convert people and make them sedentary Christians, right, if they're hunters and gatherers. They don't have any farming experience, you know, and they want to get on the move, you know. You know, they go by seasons, up to the mountains in the summer, down in the plains in, in the, you know, in the winter, you know, where it's warmer. So anyway, that's something to really to consider is, uh, you know, what really happened there. Uh, there was an attempt that didn't work out too well. Well, the Sumas, you, you, you know where uh, the Bo Bracero camp is near Socorro? Where the, uh, the poor farm was in the same area? There was a, there was a hacienda, like the Tiburcio hacienda, Tiburcio's hacienda I mentioned, there was a hacienda of San Antonio right there in the area. And right next to, the, to that area, right in the same area, and that's between the two land grants of, of, uh, of uh, Socorro, the Piro Indians, and Isleta, the Tiwi Indians, right in that area was uh, the La Señora de Las Caldas. You ever heard of that? A mission of the warm waters, Santa Maria Caldas. Okay? And that exists in Spain. There's even a town in Spain with that name. So obviously a saint, right? I mean, for sure. And they, the Spanish created a mission there for the Suma Indians in the uh, 17, uh, 1760s. And right near the Hacienda, okay? Close to Socorro Indian Village and, and Isleta, up to the north, okay? Well, the people there, the Suma Indians who were, like I say, Apache, they got anxious to get out. And every now and then they took off. In 17, I'm trying to find the date here. Uh, in 1754, I believe it was, uh, they uh, decided to get the heck out. Okay? And a good time, the, the worst time for Apache attacks, one of the worst times, was when there were floods in the area. The most vulnerable communities in the El Paso area at that time were those on the left bank, the left bank being you, the water goes down this way, this is the left, this is the right. If you say north, south, east bank, it gets really confusing because the river goes like that. But anyway, the so-called 
left bank is now the U.S. bank. The right bank is now the Mexican bank, okay? So anyway, th those, the left bank communities at that time, that, those lands, and even on the other side, were very vulnerable during flood season because everything was confusing, you know? The roads didn't work, blah, blah, blah. And it was a perfect time for the Apaches to come in and raid and attack and, you know, get some cattle, whatever they wanted, you know? So the Sumi Indians rose up at that time, uh, that, that flood uh, that took place in, uh, oh, let me see, in 1745, they rose up and they left Las Caldas Mission. And they caused a lot of damage. And then, uh, then uh, about 1749, five year, four years later, uh, well, they had already been, uh, they, the Spanish got them back by force, the Presidio troops, and put them back in. But like I said, 1749, they decided to rebel again and they took off and that time never came back. And a lot of those, Sumi Indians who were Apache relations, okay, they went to the Sierra Madres to the mountains and I think their descendants are there today, I think. Anyway, anyway, uh, that ended in 1749, the uh, Las Caldas mission, and also ended the Hacienda of San Antonio. So, okay, let's go to another one. This is a, uh, an early drawing in the 1850, I don't know what's, 1851, it's thereabouts, by John Russell Bartlett. Did you know who he was? He was U.S. Boundary Commissioner. And he was a very well-educated man, but he was a darn good artist. And he made that beautiful drawing of the Presidio of uh, San Lazario. Okay? One thing I want to say, talking about this, this mystery mission, is that on that old grant that I found, where it referred to it as the Iglesia de los, los Indios, okay? Made me wonder what happened to the Presidio Chapel. If the, if the Indian mission, the Monzo Indian mission, short-lived, if that was outside the walls, which I'm sure it was, uh, it might have been on higher ground because the floods came in periodically and did a lot of damage down there. And uh, a lot of the Presidio area was, was destroyed by floods and heavily damaged, and it may be that the Presidio Chapel was on a lower elevation, so maybe that's why the church would like to have a higher elevated site, which is now the site of the uh, church in Santa Lazaria, which is the site of the, I think, the, Indi the Indian Apache Indian Mission, okay? So even there, it was sort of falling apart. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, okay, there our buddy is, okay. Uh, we're going backwards instead of forward, yeah. Okay, and that's by Jose Cicero. There's an early photograph of the church there in San Lazario, okay? And that's by Jose Cisneros, a really great artist, uh, uh, showing a Presidio sh uh, uh, captain. And this is a, a Presidio soldier in his dress. And uh, that's his wife right there. And this is from California, but anyway, they, they looked like that here at the same time, er, okay? And this is much later, uh, it's a Presidio soldier, okay? Oh, there's one, an earlier side here, he's having trouble with his horse. Okay, and that's uh, sort of a mean uh, Presidio captain there standing in front of the uh, uh, San Lazario Post Chapel, and that's by Jose Cicero. This is really interesting. This is kind of interesting. Let's get over here. Uh, one person who came down here was uh, Captain Zeblin Montgomery Pike. We've all heard of Pike's Peak, that's named after him in Colorado. He, uh, about just a little bit after Lewis and Clark went to the Northwest, I think our government, I guess it would be Jefferson, or maybe it would be someone else, can't remember who the president was, but in uh, 1807, during that winter, he, ha he launched a military expedition uh, to uh, check out the area w west of what we'd call a Louisiana Purchase, okay? There wasn't any defined boundary between what had been belonged to uh, France and what, uh, you know, later beca became part of the United States and what belonged to Spain. You know, it was sort of a, you know, ill-defined boundary. So he went out sort of checking that out. And the Spanish forces in the winter of 1807 found him and his men and surrounded them and arrested them. And they took them all the way back into Mexico. I think they went all the way to Mexico City, as a matter of fact. 
They came through El Paso, okay? However, they were well treated, believe it or not. And, and uh, Pike was allowed to carry his big, what do you call it, musket or what have you, you know? Which is pretty long. Didn't have any uh, gunpowder in it, but he could carry it. And he took full advantage of that because he wrote notes, like a, sort of like a diary, abbreviated diary. And he rolled the paper after he wrote his diary for the week or something. He rolled it and hit, hit it in, in his musket, his double-barreled musket. So, I mean, that's good. So we got to know what happened. Anyway, the Spanish forces escorted the American captives down the Rio Grande all the way to Mexico City. But along their way, they were the first Anglo-Americans, or Norte Americanos, to visit the San Elizario Presidio. This is the year 1807. On March 23, 1807, he and his uh, fellow prisoners arrived in San Elizario, where they were warm, warmly received by the Presidio people and the people in the community, and given good meals and lodging. Okay? So he made a secret entry in his journal, which he concealed in his musket barrel, he wrote the following about the independent nature of the Apaches at the fort, as well as the Sunday mass that was attended by the Presidio soldiers. And I'm going to read that to you. But let me say one thing, and this was told to me by people down there in San Elizario. This is about 15 years ago or so. They told me that their grandparents had to be pretty darn careful attending mass at the Presidio chapel on Sunday. Uh, it would always be good to have one or two members of the family stay at the house, okay? So, some of the, their farms and what have you, and even their homes were outside the, uh, the Presidio walls. Because the Apaches would take full advantage of that. They're attending mass. We'll go into their, break into their home and take this and that. We like this, you know, this is great. This is a better blanket, you know, than what we have. So, you know, so they had to be careful. They told me about that. Anyway, he attended the mass that Sunday, and in, in Pike did, 1807, March 23rd, and he wrote this. Round this fort were a great number of Apaches who were on a treaty with the Spaniards, okay? These people appeared perfectly independent in their manners and were the only savages I saw in the Spanish dominions whose spirit was not humbled and whose neck was not bound to the yoke of their invaders. He said, divine services were performed in the morning at the garrison, that would be the Presidio Chapel, at which all troops attended under arms. They even had their arms. Uh, at one point on their mass, they present arms at, at another sink on one knee and rest the muzzle of the gun on the ground in signification of their submission to their divine master. So this is kind of interesting because it's one of the only accounts that I found, I haven't done a lot of research on this, that reference the Apaches, you know? Now, there, there's other references. You know, if you go through some of the uh, census records of uh, El Paso area, Paso del Norte, which includes, uh, you know, the whole area, including San Elizario, they reference, uh, in their records, uh, sometimes they reference Apaches, even in the census records. And uh, uh, there's a number of of records here. One, one is here, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, one is 1701, and this is not necessarily in this area, but it pertains to this area. The, uh, the priests announced that uh, uh, taking, purchasing Apache captives was forbidden. You couldn't do that. There was slavery here in the El Paso area. Most of the slaves were not black, although there were 16 or 17 that I found that were sold at Hart's Mill. Can you imagine that? By their first name, Susie was sold for, you know, $50. Uh, Anthony was sold for 50 you know, blah, blah, blah. Hart's Mill, this is in the 1840s or 1850s, excuse me, 60s. However, the one priest, uh, he uh, announced to the people in the area that it's forbidden to purchase uh, uh, Apache captives. You can't do that, okay? Uh, that's kind of interesting. The Book of Baptisms uh, in New Mexico and this area too uh, identify Apaches uh, like in this area here in El Paso, El Paso del Norte, December 7th, 1708, belonging to Don Antonio Valarde, that's a major family in, in El Paso del Norte, 
uh, he had uh, uh, 17 adult Apaches. They're like captives or slaves, right? And then you'll find also references to slavery. Here's a census here. Let me see here. Uh, this is uh, 1784. Uh, the census here in the area includes Espanoles, Mestizos, Mulatos, Indios, Coyotes, which are, are more or less Indians living, so-called friendly Indians living in the area that came from the plains, and Negroes, of course. Ten slaves are listed, four males and six females were uh, Indians, as well as, and that would be Apaches, as well as three black servants, they call them. And uh, so there's records. Uh, here's another one here. Ooh, what's the date on this? This is 1860. This is uh, not too far away. It's at Fort Davis. There's an 18-year-old young man. His name is Valentin Rodriguez. He's a herder, and he's an Indian captive. He was born in Mexico, so he was probably Apache. And uh, let's go to the next one, Norma. I can talk for hours. Sorry. I keep forgetting. Well, th this, uh, this shows uh, Waco Tanks. It's the northwest part of Waco Tanks. And this was, all, this was also done by Boundary Commissioner uh, uh, Bartlett back in, uh, well, like I said, 18, in 1851, I believe. It's a beautiful drawing, isn't it? He was really impressed with Waco Tanks and especially the, the, the art on the walls, which uh, could have been done by God knows who, Apaches as well as earlier tribes, as well as the Tiwas. And you can see them, it looks like, looks like maybe this guy, they're like they're dancing or something here, celebrating, you know. So those are probably Pueblo Indians, but maybe not, who knows. And these are our Tiwa Indians there, very early photograph at Waco Tanks, and there's the tribal drum, okay. The Tiwas claim Waco Tanks, but so do a lot of Apaches, they claim Waco Tanks. And even the Comanches and Kiowa came in here and claimed Waco and like Waco Tank. Now, who's this? This is very interesting. This is a Waco Tank. This is a drawing made by an artist uh, on watercolor back in the 1940s, and it's from Waco Tanks. And uh, it's a drawing of a Presidio soldier from San Elizario. Isn't that inter interesting? Let's go to the next one. And this, of course, is uh, the Camino Real, the, uh, uh, what, how, how did you say it? The, the, uh, yeah, I, yeah, yes, I-10, the, the, uh, well, the, the Hornado de Muerto, the, 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 the uh, journey of the, of the dead, right? Okay. And uh, that uh, my friend uh, Jody Schwartz took a number of years ago. It's original route. You can still identify it. And this is also by uh, the expedition of the uh, U.S. Boundary Commissioners, 1850s, and that's by a good artist uh, who accompanied that expedition, his name was Henry Cheever Pratt. He did a really nice portrait of, uh, of James Wiley McGoffin. And that's the, those are the Oregon Mountains. And the Oregon Mountains is very important because the Apaches lived not only, they lived all over, particularly in the mountains, the Oregon Mountains. And uh, in the 1784 or thereabouts, a chief from the, this is before the Apache Deposit Program, a chief with a whole bunch of Apache Indians came in and they were, he said that, he came into El Paso del Norte and he said that they were from the Oregon Mountains, also known as the uh, Sierra de los Manzos after the Manzo Indians. And he wanted to come in and settle, he was tired of, you know, raiding and what have you, and they wanted to have peace, they wanted to settle among the Pueblos, communities anywhere, you know, near the Mission, Guadalupe Mission, or Seneca, or anywhere, they wanted to settle, become peaceful. And the Spanish authorities said, no, that was before the Apache uh, peace program, Apaches de Paz, maybe about five or six years before that. So there were attempts by some Apaches, you know, you're tired of, you know, this sort of rigorous, hard life of uh, raiding and what have you. And they wanted to come in and settle, okay? And of course, the east of uh, the, the river, what, Conchos, I'm trying to think, getting my mind to work, uh, uh, the, the uh, east, Excuse me, what is the river east? Help me, George. Well, east, east, going east uh, from... Uh, Below the Rio Grande, the Concho, yeah, you're right. Yeah, okay, well, that, that area, going east, uh, uh, there were buffalo, there were plain, the plains are headed towards the plains, and that's where the buffalo 
are, and the Apaches took full advantage. One of the problems that the Apaches had went, uh, after the Spanish came in is that not only the Spanish uh, uh, lost some control of the horses and whatever, and the Apaches ended up with the horses, but sometimes the Apaches preferred to ride their horses into a village like in Chihuahua, get off, you know, and then go five or six miles on foot, then raid. They felt more comfortable, at least some of them did. But the guys that really enjoyed riding horses and really took advantage of it were the uh, Plains Indians, the Kiowa, the Comanche, and what have you. And they, they did such a good job, they pushed a lot of Apache people out of, uh, out of the plains, like the Lipan Apaches, they ended up down in Presidio and Mescalero and Ojinaga, that area. And I've talked to some of, some of their d descendants who told me uh, the story about that. In fact, one woman in Mescalero, her name was Meredith Begay, she was a medicine woman back in the 1960s. She told me that her great-grandfather, might have been her grandfather too, uh, wanted, wanted to help these uh, Norte Americanos that were having problems east of here. And, they, and he wanted to call a meeting with other Apache groups, and they were Lipan Apaches. And they wanted to help these people. You know who those people were? The Alamo. Boy and the bunch at the Alamo. And they had this meeting, the, the other Apache leaders attended that meeting and said, no, no, that's their thing, let's stay out of it. So they didn't do it. Who knows, history might have been different. Let's go to the next story, and, or the next picture. There is, uh, of course, uh, the same period of time that's uh, by a, a French uh, artist who was also on that expedition uh, with the uh, U.S. Boundary Commission in the 1850s, and that's the, uh, the cathedral, uh, well, I, 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 excuse me, the Guadalupe Mission. And this guy is a French priest, Bordelais, I think his name was, if I can pronounce it properly, who was in San Elizario back in the 1870s. And he realized that there was problems going on in the communities, that people were really upset with these Norte Americanos because they were gringos, because they were taking the salt beds over there uh, at the Guadalupe Salt Flats. And he was very upset, and, he, and they were threatening to go out and kill these gringos, go out and, you know, we're gonna take our land. And even the Indians, T was and what have you, wanted to go fight and get their salt beds because they were communal lands. Even, even the priest, Ra Ramon Ortiz at, uh, at the, uh, beloved curate at the uh, Guadalupe Mission, he, he, was in, uh, he was not in favor of fighting, but he was sympathetic with the people because that was communal salt property. And this priest got very concerned. He sent a telegram to the, to the military uh, uh, commander, and he wasn't here locally, he was, I think, in Austin, telling him we're gonna have one terrible thing, you know, a war take place. Please send troops down here, please resolve this issue. Well, the military commander just ignored it, and boom, the, the Salt War, 1877-1878, blew up. So Bordelais tried, and this is, uh, this is Ramon Ortiz, the priest at the mission, who was concerned about the Salt War and what have you, and uh, a friend of, and those are, maybe, maybe the guy that you just saw, maybe he's there. Anyway, that's a good picture that I got from Gun. Gus, uh, Gus Lujan, you know Gustavo Lujan? Any of you? He's an, when he moved to Corpus Christi. He was in San Lazario. This, this is a, a, a tribal leader. I worked with many Apache tribes in, in Arizona uh, when I was with Indian Health Service even before that. And uh, I, I worked with the Tano Apaches, helping them get recognized. Near, you know where Payson is, per, Payson, Arizona? Uh, north of Phoenix, about maybe 140 miles or so, up on the Mugillon or Mugillon Rim. And, uh, and they were living on a, on, a, uh, on a national forest that they were considered as, as squatters. You know the name of the forest? Tano National Forest. You know the name of the tribe? Tano Apache. They were living on their own land. And so you know, fortunately that was resolved and they got some of the land back and what have you. Re really good people. And, uh, and this is a group uh, of, of Apaches uh, 1851 again by uh, Russell Bartlett, the uh, boundary commissioner. Did some really nice artwork. The next image is really nice. It shows what, let's go see it. A boot or a moccasin, where is it Norma? There it is, see, there's a war cap too, Apache. Okay, let's go to the next one. And that is a Cherokee Apache shirt, 35 inches long it says, okay. Just a minute, there's a, a, a warrior. 
when, 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 when I was at the library some time ago, stop, Norma. When I was at the library some time, I'm looking at the clock. When I was at the library some time ago, uh, I stumbled onto a guy just by accident looking at books. And he was originally from Mexico. And he, was, he said he was uh, Lipan, uh, no, no, excuse me. He, he was uh, Apache, okay? Not Lipan, but Apache. Uh, and uh, from Apache tribe. And, uh, and I, I had no idea there was an Apache tribe in, in the Sierra Madres in, in northern Mexico. So I contacted some of my friends at Mescalero, and they drove down there because they thought it was a big joke. And they met some of the people up there in the Sierra Madres, and they said, my God, the old, the old people know, know our language. You know, so the Apaches were all over the place. Let's go to the next one. There's, and that's another Apache, or Comanche it says, sorry. Plains, okay. There's a group of Apache scouts. And that's a, a medicine man from uh, Tano Apache, uh, Arizona. I knew his family. And there's one of their, their camps, and that's probably the way it was here. Uh, if you go up into the mountains here, when the Apaches took off, they made camps. Some of them, uh, because their association with the Plains Apaches, probably had more or less like teepees. Others had wiki-ups or brush shelters like that. And those were taken in the 1900s. This is uh, from the Smithsonian Foundation, a drawing that was made in the 1870s or thereabouts, 18, eight, eight, 1880s at least. And this is sort of a stereotypical racial interpretation of Apaches. It's, it's, not, it's very derogatory. But I put it in there anyway. You can see it, Tonto Apaches. And there's a nice-looking young woman with an Indian basket and what have you. It's uh, taken in southern Arizona back in the 1880s. And, oh boy, what I'm doing here. Uh, I, 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 when I was working with the Pace and Apaches, I didn't bring the photograph, it's on, it's on a frame in my house. I met a family whose grandfather, and a great grandfather for some of them, was a well-known Apache scout. He was Tano Apache. And he served with Captain Cook, or with uh, General Crook, excuse me, Cook getting all mixed up, and uh, uh, going after Geronimo. And he met Geronimo in 1886 or thereabouts, and, and he talked Geronimo into surrendering, okay, which he did. And all the books, they give credit to the to American military. It was really this one, one, the family said, I believe it, and they had a photograph of him, and he's with a gun, and he's photographed standing in front of a, of a wiki up. And when, when they surrendered, in, uh, in no northern New Mexico, not too far from Deming, uh, they boarded a train and were brought all the way to Florida where they were put into a prison for a number of time, a number of years, and also another place was it, I'm trying to think where was the other place, uh, name escapes me, it's further east, and a number of them died because of the climate and what have you, but uh, those are the group, and L Lo Sen is here, who's a famous Apache warrior woman. She had powers, uh, her, her family up there at Mescalero said she had incredible power. She could go like this when they were, you know, out in the hills. And she had, like, radar. Uh-oh, this is bad over here. And sure enough, you could, 20 minutes later, you could see the uh, uh, troops, you know, you know, coming in, you know, looking for Apache. So, they, you know, she helped several times to get them out, and she actually fought physically. Okay. Is that third from the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was Geronimo. <coughs> I'm interested in Los End. Uh, yeah, I should have mentioned that. Thank you. Okay, and that, this is an early drawing of a map here from the year seven, 18, 1758. So that would be before Santa Lazario, a number of years before, by a uh, Spanish uh, uh, map maker, cartographer, and artist. And in the drawing here, he includes what could be not. Could be, could be an Apache Indian, who knows, and the others could be Pueblo, who knows. Okay, is that it? Oh, great, okay. Whew, sorry, any, any questions? Well, so, I don't know. It would be interesting to, to I believe that there really was a, a Apache mission in San Lazario, and it was probably sporadic. Every now and then they would take off to the mountains and then come back. You know, what did they come back for? Guns, uh, you know, food, you know, uh, 
grain, you know, and what have you. So anyway, it failed. But anyway, it, you could call it a mission, even though it was a failure. This program is made possible in part by a grant from Humanities Texas, the state affiliate of the National Endowment for the Humanities.